Hey guys, it's Sharon from Digital Nomad Quest. And this is Sean with Everything REI. And today we're going to do an update episode. We're going to talk all about our moldy house, our Airbnb, and our move to Dallas. Now, if you guys are new to this channel, welcome. I'm all about teaching y'all how to build passive income, become financially free, and design your best life. So if you guys are interested in that, make sure to subscribe and hit the bell button to be notified of my latest episodes. And make sure to subscribe to Sean's channel where he talks all about real estate investing. In today's episode, we're actually going to kind of share an episode on Sean's Everything Real Estate Investing investing show he has a podcast actually so go ahead and check it out so we filmed the video version of us talking on that episode so you guys can check it out now what's going on investors and welcome to episode 249 of the everything real estate investing show with sean pan today we have a very special episode because i have my fiance here sharon sung and we're going to go over a little bit about our current real estate investing projects so we have three things that we're going to touch upon today we're going to start with our burr project over in texas airbnb that we recently did we moved out of our house here in the south bay and airbnb it out. Finally, we're actually going to be moving to Texas. So we might talk a little bit about moving there and why we decided to go there as well. But before we do that, I want to introduce my fiance, Sharon. So Sharon, you know, welcome to the show. And for those of our listeners who don't know you, do you want to give a quick intro to who you are? Yeah, definitely. So I think my whole story that I tell a lot of people is that, you know, in 2016, I quit my job and traveled the world for two years as a digital nomad while building passive income streams. And now I kind of teach people all about that, about side hustles, investing, and personal finance, talk all about, you know, real state as well, you know, trying to get people to achieve financial freedom. So I talk all about that on my TikTok, my Instagram and my YouTube. Yeah, so definitely follow her on Instagram and you know, TikTok. She's definitely a lot more popular than I am. <laughs> all right. So before we get into everything, I guess we can start with the birth strategy. So what is the birth strategy for again, those listeners who are maybe new to real estate investing, they happen to wander on this podcast and don't know what it's about. What is the birth strategy? Burr is basically buy, rehab, rent, refinance, repeat. So it's this whole strategy where you can essentially essentially get cash out of a home you're purchasing and then you're going to be able to recycle that and like put it into more yeah. projects. So that's what we're trying to do with the moldy house right now. If you guys have seen what we've been doing, basically, we purchased a property at $120,000. We are fixing it up right now. We're planning to rent it out to tenants. And then after six months, we're planning to refinance and get money back out so we can put that into other projects. Yeah. And that house was, it was a mess, right? When we bought the property and we saw the pictures online, we were kind of scared, right? Like, oh my God, is even doable. I wasn't even going into it. Like you were the only one like walking inside. I was not about to go into it. By that time we were already on a contract though. So you did have like that confidence that it would work out. Oh yeah. I mean the ARV is like 300000 or more right now. I just felt like it was a good project to try. I feel like right now I think the numbers are working out pretty well. I'm really excited about where it's going to be. You guys do see pictures of it. It's completely renovated, remediated and everything like that. It looks so good right now. I remember but when we were first first looking at that listing, Mm -hmm. we were thinking like, oh my God, this is kind of scary. How can you even like get rid of this kind of mold? Because we didn't know about mold remediation before this. Really, it is by doing that you learn the most. We started calling different people. You even had someone on YouTube give you some recommendations, right? Yeah. When we first bought it, I feel like the pictures were not as bad as it seemed. I know when we were buying it, you were like, you know, it shouldn't be too bad. But then... Just cut out the drywall, right? Yeah, exactly. Not that big deal. But then I remember we were doing inspections and the inspector was like, oh my God, like I can't go inside. The neighbors are telling me no one goes in here. It's like really disgusting. We need to figure out a different solution. So that freaked me out. I went on YouTube. I was trying to look up like mold remediation who can give us some advice on that. I found somebody, I sent them like a bunch of information. They were actually really nice about it and gave us a lot of tips. So it was definitely like a roller coaster because I remember in the beginning we were like, okay. And then later we were like, oh my God, this could be a nightmare. Yeah, because when we got into the contract, we bought it for like $125,000 and you know, the wholesaler was saying, oh yeah, like $75,000. You should be good to finish everything like mold remediation and the rehab budget. And we're thinking, okay, like this property is in Texas. It's probably going to be cheaper to do a full remodel. But obviously that wasn't the case, right? We started getting quotes everywhere, right? From like $20,000 to fifty thousand dollars to do the mold remediation and not to mention like you mean like three hundred thousand dollars for the construction so we were getting scared like did we just buy a bad deal that was definitely very scary and really it wasn't until we actually went to texas and hung on the area for two weeks and we started making a whole bunch of phone calls calling all different kinds of contractors we we're looking at people on facebook we we're just going down the entire phone book on yelp eventually we found people who could do the project at reasonable costs you get a whole spectrum of people who 
charge you different stuff. Yeah, I mean, you said 75. It ended up being kind of close to that. Act but we had to work we, for it. We worked so hard for that <laughs> because, you know, we were there for that period of time. It's kind of crazy reflecting on that. It's been a while. We've been doing so much stuff lately. But, you know, back we were calling so many people, meeting up with so many different contractors, mold remediation companies. Luckily, we found the right quotes. We found the right people. Definitely want to find people you can really trust. I mean, the mold remediator was someone referred to us by the Airbnb host which is what a coincidence, right? So lucky. And then the contractor was someone who's trying to buy the property too. Yep. We somehow outbid him and then he was on the phone with them and they, I guess they like never called him back or just something like that. Just ghosted him because we had a cleaner offer maybe. Yeah, maybe and something we were five like grand more. Yeah, so he was like, oh, I want to do like a long-term partnership with you guys. He wanted to work with us on this project so that, you know, in the future, if we like his work, we could keep working with him. So it was just like a perfect combination. Like we were able to get the right people. Yeah, yeah. And so far, the project has been going pretty well. You know, everything kind of is expected. Yeah, we're on budget, so it's good. Hopefully by the end of this month, which is November, project should be done. Maybe mm -hmm. rent it up by mid-December and then do the cash out refinance in March. Yeah, for those of you guys who don't know what a cash out refinance is, it's basically a refinance, but you get cash out. When we bought this property, we pay for it in cash and then we use a private money loan to pay for the rehab budget. The cash out refinance will allow us to get all of our funds back out. So the purchase price plus the rehab budget so we can pay it back off our private money lender and we'll have it on like a 30 year mortgage. Mm -hmm. at really low rates. We're supposed to be done November, like end of November. So we're getting pretty close. Thank you for doing the heavy lifting. I feel like when it comes to working with a contractor, I feel like he's been talking to him a lot and you're even answering a lot of the questions. So how's that been for you? <laughs> no, it's been chill. I mean, the contractor is a super nice guy, very flexible. And he actually has a lot of recommendations because he's an investor himself. Mm -hmm. So he sends me pictures, he sends me quotes, you know, he does. Also, another thing too, is we were able to lower the contractor's bid because we offered to pay for just the labor. Normally when you get a GC, I think people pay for everything. And then the GC will pay for like the materials and they usually mark up maybe 10 to 15% on the materials. So for us to just buy the materials directly was great because now we get to learn as investors what things cost. We just pay them the labor. So we don't have to worry about him running out of money, mm -hmm. right? That's a big problem that contractors have. Sometimes they run out of money and they start doing different jobs and using the other jobs deposit for your project. You know, it gets messy. Mm -hmm. So for this relationship, it's been pretty good. I feel like we've been learning a lot because we know the, the quotes now. We know how much things should should cost. I feel like he's been working with you a lot because I don't know, he doesn't call me for some reason. He just talks to you. But ultimately, we both kind of talk about, okay, what do we want for the house? Do we want this carpet? Do we want this flooring or whatever? It's been a great learning process for both of us, I think. Yeah. And I guess the most important part is building that relationship. You're constantly working with the same people and doing more and more deals over time. Yeah. I guess the last thing is the reason why we're waiting until March is that <laughs> um, <laughs> cash out refinances are usually a bit trickier for banks. Let's say we try to do a refinance now right before this like six month seasoning period is what they call it they would value the property based on our purchase price of $120,000 not on that future value after it's remodeled of like mm -hmm. 300 plus so they want us to wait six months of owning the property before they'll do a new appraisal and then use that new appraised value that way we can get you know 75% of 300,000 instead of 75% of $120,000 yeah you want to talk about what happened to you before you, yeah you're I trying mean, to do it right it happened to me right I thought that I was buying a property below market value okay this was five years years ago, I bought my first rental property in Jacksonville. It was listed for $100,000. All the comps in there said that it should be worth $100,000. However, that particular property had a tenant inside. No like normal buyers would buy that property, only investors. And you know, the sellers wanted out. So I gave them a cash offer to buy quickly. And I was able to buy it for a purchase price of $77,000. Quite a big discount. If you figure 75% of $100,000, right, which is what I was expecting, then I technically should have gotten $75,000 back. From a loan. That means I'm only in the deal for two grand. However, they looked at it and they said, well, you just bought it for 77,000. Therefore, this property must be worth $77,000. Mm. And therefore, we can only give you a loan of 75% of $77,000. And so I was a very sad boy, but I took what I, you know, <laughs> I was like, hey, I paid for the appraisal already. I don't really need all this money, right? Mm -hmm. Fine. Give me, give me what you got. So yeah. lesson learned, if you guys are trying to cash out refinance the birth strategy and you're going with traditional banks, typically they want you to wait six months. Mm -hmm. Not always the case. Yeah, right? not always the case. Some banks, don't have season period. Yeah. You have to call a lot of banks for that. Yeah, you should try to check with multiple lenders, see what their you know different terms are, different financing options, yeah. see what you can get. Yeah, absolutely. All right, so is there anything else that you want to talk about? No, I think that you know everything's going smoothly and then we started working on 
other things. There's so many different things we're doing. There's too many different things. So that's the Moldy Hodge project. It's in progress, but it's very exciting to talk about. Mm -hmm. Okay, so the next thing that we were talking about is our Airbnb. We knew that we wanted to move to Texas at some point because we thought there was more opportunity. And we'll mm -hmm. get to that in the third section. But I didn't want to sell my house in the Bay Area. You know, this is the house that I grew up in. We've owned this house for a long time. I have a lot of equity in the property. If I were to sell, you know, first of all, I'm going to pay a lot of taxes, mm -hmm. even with the section 121 exclusion that gives me $250,000 tax free. But I'm starting to pay taxes on a lot more money. And on top of that, then I lose my family home. You know, yeah. what for, right? I think the property could continue improving in value. And honestly, my mortgage is so low that I don't need to sell. I mean, I think any Bay Area property, I want to keep. If you can hold if on to it. you can hold on to it, yeah. You hold on to it. Even your NAC property, right? Mm -hmm. You've had it for what, seven years? Oh man. Almost 10 now, actually. Yeah, I think it's eight or nine, actually. Yeah. Okay, and that thing has improved a lot. Yeah, it's appreciated like $400,000 or and, more. And it cash yeah. flows, right? Yeah, it cash flows. And there's no reason to sell. I love holding on to buy and holds if I can. Yeah, especially in the Bay Area. If yeah. they're not alligator properties, hold on to them yeah. if you can. In the Bay Area, right? If you were to do traditional rentals, like what we do with our out-of-state properties, the numbers usually don't work. Mm -hmm. uh, as an example, right, the 1% rule, do you want to explain what that, uh, that is to our listeners? Basically, the rent price to purchase price, you want to make sure it's 1% of that. It's a guideline. It's not something you have to follow. It's like an easy way to understand the numbers. So as an easy example, if the purchase price of the home is $200,000, mm -hmm. then it should rent for $2,000 mm -hmm. per month. That would cover all the expenses. In the Bay Area, if you use that same ratio, if the property is a million dollars, then every month it should rent for how much? <laughs> yeah, like 10,000. 10,000. Yeah. But Bay Area properties don't rent for 10,000 a mm. month. And maybe unless you're in like Palo Alto or something crazy. But for like a home in the South Bay, you're thinking like three to four grand. So that's a 0. 0.3 to 0. 0.4% ratio. It's just ratio. not gonna work. Your mortgage on that property alone mm -hmm. is gonna be six grand a month. Not to mention the property taxes and insurance. So it usually doesn't work. However, Airbnb comes along. Mm -hmm. And that changed the game. It does. Do you want to talk a little about Airbnb? Yeah, I mean, basically short term rentals. If you can rent it out for a shorter period of time on Airbnb, you could actually get bigger gains. Like I know someone making 60 grand a month from four properties in Tennessee. Yep. So it's insane how much you can actually make from short term rentals. But what we're doing is we're renting it out for 30 plus days because of the city regulations. You want to make sure you're checking the city regulations and what they allow for short term rentals. If they don't allow it, then that's kind of a way to bypass it to do 30 plus furnished rentals. Absolutely. So yeah, just to reiterate, normally, if we could just have like pure vacation rentals, just rent out for a week at a time, we would do it because generally you can get like more liquidity, right? Right. People can come and go. You don't have to block it at a month at a time. Mm -hmm. And you're renting it for like what, two hundred bucks a night, two fifty a night. Heard... In general, if you could rent it on a daily oh. basis. Yeah, hopefully in the future. You're talking about ours. Just or... like in general, in the Bay Area. Yeah, I think you could do two hundred plus. Kind of depends how many bedroom bath. Like, what's yeah. the count for that? We're doing it at one eighty, one ninety right now, and. We're, we're trying to rack up those reviews. So yeah, we not... don't have any reviews, right? <laughs> so we have to gain the trust first, yeah. become super hosts. Mm -hmm, and mm -hmm. then, bam. Bam. <laughs> well, it's good because right now it's still the winter months, right? Mm -hmm, and mm -hmm. we do have reviews. We have some reviews. Right now, the people who are living in our property are like Tesla interns. And they're yeah. very nice kids, <laughs> yeah. right? Hopefully, they give us good reviews. And then by the time summer comes along, you know, hopefully the pandemic is over. And we have more and more of these people who are coming by for like corporate events, right? Imagine a Google high executive needs to be coming over in the Bay Area and live in our house. That would be nice. Right. Not bad. I've also heard of like other insurance companies mm. who have displaced families. They'll pay like eight grand a month. Oh, really? So if you think about it, even at 180, 180 per night, it's like 5,000 a month ish, right? Mm -hmm. 5,000 a month is almost two times what you make from a normal rental. Mm -hmm. And that way, not only does this cover my current mortgage, my current PITI, it will cover whatever we have to pay for another property when we move to Texas. Yeah, we're trying to do a little Airbnb house hack. We are actually in escrow for a property in Dallas, Texas, which is yeah. really exciting. We're planning to have the Airbnb rents pay for the mortgage on both properties. So it's really exciting. I feel like the numbers work pretty well. So far, so good. Again, the scary part about 30 day rentals is that not everyone can book it. So like you might have some blank spots. We even got some inquiries from someone who wants to book it from like mid-Feb to mid-March. But then now needs a gap from like December and January. Yeah, we were looking into it. We we're like, could we run it two months between that? And we couldn't. So we were like, can you book closer to the date? They were trying to get a discount and stuff like that. We we're like, maybe we can offer one if it's like closer, just because the way we're doing a 30 plus is just harder, right? I do feel like 30 plus is, I hope it'll get occupied, but we'll see what happens. And if, if it's a shorter period of time, I feel like you could probably charge even more. So that kind of sucks, but we'll see what happens. I mean, again, it's a limitation and the 30 day plus thing bypasses the limitation. Mm -hmm. Otherwise we just couldn't do it. 
Yeah. Right. And we would just have to rent it for 3000 a month. This way, 30 plus days, we can rent it as like a fully furnished rental for 30 plus days at a time. One thing is you could also just list on so many different platforms. So we have listed on VRBO. We listed on, I think, booking.com, put it on the Facebook marketplace. But there's so many other ones. I think there's ones for like traveling. It's like nurses. an address. Yeah. There's-, there's an insurance one as well that we should do later on. From doing this like short term rental stuff, how has this differed from a regular rental that we just go? Yeah. With? I mean, for some reason, if feels more fulfilling in a way because you're so up close and personal with it. We did so much in renovation. We fixed all these different things. We fixed the bathroom. We fixed the fence in the back. We did a whole paint job on the exterior. We did a lot of like kind of gardening stuff, I guess, or landscaping. We even planted stuff. seeds yeah, yeah. <laughs> to make it a little bit nicer. Yeah, we did a lot of stuff. It's fulfilling too, fixing up, you know, our home. It's also fulfilling because we get to speak with, you know, the people coming in. We see like the ring doorbell footage because you have to let them know if you have security cameras. So we have one in the front we get to see the little kids walking out at 6 45 a.m and we're just like oh it's so cute <laughs> <laughs> yeah i mean they're coming from like another state right and i think mm-hmm. tesla paid for them to come through so they're covering like their expenses mm-hmm. so the kids don't mind like paying a lot for a big place mm-hmm. but you can see them like hustling waking up and then like going out for dinner and stuff it's, it's pretty interesting and then yeah we spend a lot of time making these little touches like decorating the place hiring a cleaner to come work with us creating like the guidebook oh the guidebook i'm so right. happy about that yeah we try to make everything so nice so it's it's really exciting to see people coming into it and like experiencing it. I know the footage when they came in, they're like, ooh, and we're like yeah. so happy about that. It's nice to be that close and personal with the property. I mean, it is your childhood home too. So it's nice to see the progression. All rentals though, it's really fun to see the transformation from making it beautiful from distress. Um, I mean, my house wasn't that distressed. It was just, <laughs> it was just a dash okay. the before. Okay. okay, it wasn't distressed, but we definitely made a lot of updates. I think we've spent like 15 grand up yeah. after a long period of time and it's grown a lot but you can be really I mean, nice. you'd be surprised like what a nice fresh coat of paint will do to a place right before sure. i had these like you call them ugly yellow walls <laughs> they're not that bad they're okay but I now guess. we have a nice gray color you know it's more modern what would you say is like the biggest difference for you the, the lighting for sure no, so, no i'm talking about biggest difference with airbnb versus traditional rentals. it's kind of like you said you care a little bit more about your airbnbs because mm-hmm. it is more of an active business yeah. whereas for the rental properties like we haven't seen many of our properties that we have Mm -hmm. and again same with the team right we outsource that to a property manager we make sure to put the best pm companies there to make sure that they have a good experience it does feel though that we are a little bit removed but at the same time you know we check up on the pms and stuff like that but with an airbnb like you said it it is a more involved business i do feel like we are experiencing the good parts so far and we'll see if there's gonna be nightmares because like we spoke with the cleaner that we hired and she was saying how the other property she's working on there's like a rager like a fat party and like it sounds like it could be problematic we just got to make sure we're on top of it and getting the right people in making sure those people have like reviews on the airbnb and stuff like that that are positive yeah but that's actually kind of a benefit of our situation because we are forced to do 30 plus day stuff so Mm -hmm. like we did get an inquiry from someone who wanted to run our place out for one weekend while they were going to go to like a football game at the Levi mm-hmm. Stadium. Dude, I was like, well, first of all, we can't do it. We just can't do it. So nothing against you. But if we had something like that in our house with six adults and they're going to a football game, there's a good chance they're going to throw a party afterwards. If they're 30 plus days, the chance of them throwing a big True. party is very low because they're actually going to be here for work or yeah. for a long term stay. Plus, all of our stuff is non refundable, mm-hmm. you know, so if they're really going to risk blowing 30 days, because of one party, well, yeah. that's on them, right? Yeah, that's true. And we can kick them out. We can say, hey, we have, you have a party and that's not allowed. And mm-hmm. we're going to keep all 30 days, a lot of money. Yeah, so we should be okay. Yeah. yeah, versus like homes that are available just for one or two nights. So, I mean, yeah, I think Airbnb is interesting so far. I've enjoyed it. I'm glad that we haven't moved to Texas just yet. Like we can be here for the next few months while kind of overseeing this other property. Like if something goes wrong, mm-hmm. we can be there and we'll know. We're also gaining some amazing experience. That guidebook. Yeah. We wrote it once. We can Mm -hmm. use that same template on any other ones. Yeah, for sure. Basically, I bought this template on Etsy, actually, and then it's a Canva template so we can edit it. Y'all know I actually sell (laughs) on Etsy digital products and I totally recommend it. So if you guys do need like Airbnb guidebooks or whatever, go check on Etsy. It's a great place to find your digital products. Last thing, what would you say is like the hardest part or most surprising part about setting up everything for Airbnb? Well, we rushed it like crazy at the end. I was telling you to, we got a clean earlier, but we kind of waited till the last minute. So we were moving things 
to this home. So this is actually my parents' place while we are buying the Dallas place. We are settling in here until we get that actually fully executed and we're good and we can move into the Dallas home. During the process, we just had to move so much stuff back and forth. There's so much to clean and we thought it was like, okay, it's gonna be decently clean. And then the cleaners come in and they're like, oh, this is gonna be a deep clean. Yeah. <laughs> they're like, oh, this is gonna be more extensive. And it ended up being like three days of them cleaning, which was a lot. It's a crazy time because we had so many conferences that we we're going to. Mm -hmm. And then we went to Los Angeles for a friend's wedding. And I think the biggest thing was that we were remodeling that one bathroom. Uh, that bathroom remodel was a very interesting experience because the mm -hmm. contractor, he's like, I like him a lot, right? Very nice guy. He did the job well. Mm -hmm. However, sometimes he wouldn't pick up his phone. And that worried mm -hmm. us because we knew we had a strict deadline. We knew people were coming in on Monday mm -hmm. and the job wasn't 100% complete until Sunday, you yeah. know? So that yeah. gives a lot of anxiety. And yeah. and like, to be fair, he did tell us, okay, I'm booking you guys for this time frame, And then if it slips or whatever, let me know, we'll continue. He finished everything. We went to Los Angeles. We came back and we said, okay, come through. It just so happened that he got into a car accident. So then we were like, oh, shoot, you know? Yeah. So actually, it was an interesting time because we weren't sure if he was telling us the truth or not, right? Mm, yeah. And it's kind of like, are we going to call him out? Or mm -hmm. is he really hurt, right? Yeah. In your case, lose the situation. But he managed to pull it through and came back for us. So we're actually very grateful for him for helping us out. Yeah, I mean, I think in the future, we'll have to, I don't know, make sure that they're going to be responsive and come through and be a little strict because he could have just told us I can't do it and that would have been better versus every day it was like I'm coming and then never showing yeah we... but he was on painkillers oh no, no it's fine so... yeah it's fine but I'm just saying like let us know and then we can plan around it right or yeah. just have more people on call to be honest because having to scramble last minute for someone else it yeah. is a big hassle. So I guess I recommend that for all you guys listening to. If you have a project, have one or two people on backup call just in case. You never know. We could have. And of course, withholding payment until the very last checkup. Like not when the job is done, but when the job is done, done. Like yeah. <laughs> two weeks later, let's be reasonable. Maybe a few days later after you've tested all the plumbing stuff, mm -hmm. that's good. Because like he said it was done, right? But he said, don't turn on the water because you don't know the caulking will like break or whatever. So fine, it's fine. I paid him the money. But then I came back after LA trip and then I turned on the water. Oh, the water doesn't work because it wasn't hooked up right. Or like this thing's leaking, right? Mm -hmm. And I have to have him come back. Now, the good thing is the hard stuff was done. So at the worst, worst case, I could have done it myself. He came back eventually. Cleaning and doing anything last minute, that's probably the hardest part. Like setting up in general is a lot more complicated than I thought, right? Mm -hmm. Like when you just have a tenant inside, you can just clean the house and bounce. But with Airbnb, you need everything else to be perfect, right? You need the beds to be made, towels to be cleaned and put somewhere. You need the guidebook plus like the welcome letter or whatever. So these like are like those. different things. It's not just yeah. clean, it's clean plus more. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> we also have to go in and like log out of all the like Netflix and Hulu and all that stuff too. And I had this Google Keep to-do list every day and I would remind him like, okay, we need to do these things. Okay, we need to do these different things. <laughs> yeah, yeah. There's so many different little items that you might not think about, but there's a lot more involved with an airbnb All right it's a lot so now we're done and we're excited to do more honestly like, like you said i think it's more fulfilling it's mm -hmm. more interesting you mm -hmm. get more per deal in mm -hmm. terms of like cash flow i think yeah going forward we might just do more of those too i would say long-term rentals are more stable in a sense of you know it's you, a base. you don't need to worry too much about city regulations anything happening to airbnb so i do feel like short-term rentals it's like might as well try to do a few of them but not make that the main strategy, in my opinion, yeah. I, I would say you can build wealth quicker with it, but I want to put that money into rentals still. I, I feel the same way because you never know. Hey, maybe Airbnb might kick you off the platform. It's happened yeah. to some of my friends. Yeah. Right. Sure. Or you have a COVID situation and people just stop doing short term rentals in your market. Right. Yeah, you never know. You never know. Finally, last topic of today. Why Texas? Are we moving? Yeah. So I think there's a lot of benefits to moving to Texas. We were actually coming back from our trip visiting the Moldy House. And we were like, hey, maybe it's a good idea to move out here because we went to so many meetups and we met a lot of different investors and different contractors and all these different people that we could potentially build partnerships with. And I felt like there's a lot more opportunity out there. Whereas here, I feel like it's just so hard to get into this market. Like you mentioned, the numbers just don't really work out here, right? And there's so much competition out here. We were driving through Dallas and there were so many distressed properties for sale by owner properties in like Waco too. There were a lot of 
you know, for sale by owner properties. And we were like, oh, there are a lot of opportunities out here. And we were debating between Dallas and Austin. And Austin Airbnb laws are strict there. So same thing, we would probably have to do 30 day rentals. Whereas Dallas, we could explore more in that Airbnb territory which I was like really excited about. And the price points in Dallas are lower, so we could get in there pretty easily. We bought a property at like $280,000 recently. So we're in escrow for that right now. The reason we didn't want to do anything extravagant or anything like that for our residents is that in case, you know, we move out one to two years later, we can Airbnb it out or do a long-term rental. We were trying to make sure we had multiple exit strategies for that property. But also, you know, no income tax is nice in Texas as well. There are just like a lot of different things I could envision where it can allow us to grow our operations, scale our business, you could see us, you know, building more partnerships with all these people we've met, just continue networking as well as building our team. Like one of the things I would like to do is hire out people, grow our team to help us with not only the online side, but also the real estate side. It's really exciting. Yeah, and we also have full-time jobs that allow us to work basically wherever, you mm -hmm. know? So she works as a general manager for a startup company and I work as a hard money lender. I take calls anywhere, right? Even when we were on vacation, I was taking mm -hmm. these calls to do loans. And of course, moving to another demographic gives us more opportunity to market those loans to that new yeah, territory. I think it can help you with like growing your client base. And for me, we have people in Austin as well that I could like go out there frequently if we do any events or anything like that. It all synergizes essentially. Yeah, and Dallas and Austin are only like four hours away from each other. It's actually closer than like, you know, South Bay and Los Angeles. And on top of that, that freeway that goes between Dallas and Austin is actually not that bad. When I'm driving to LA, there's like nothing. Maybe it's Bakersfield, but I don't stop there. But <laughs> down from like Dallas to Austin, you have Waco, we have Temple, we have uh, Austin and you can keep going down, right? So there's a lot of cool stuff on the way. The drive isn't as bad. Also, I forgot to mention that we do have like close friends out there. Well, Dallas. She does. I know. Yeah, well, we also met people at this conference that they're content creators as well. I think we could probably work with them, have brainstorm sessions with them. So I'm excited for that too. And you also have Aria, right? You are part of that. Yeah. And there's like the Dallas chapter. You met some of the people. They're very welcoming. Yeah, they're actually helping us buy our property. Having these connections for like realtors, other lenders it's amazing just having that connection there also you know when we're financing this property this is cool too so in the bay area because prices are so expensive you usually can only get a jumbo loan so that means like eight hundred thousand dollar loan amount or greater because prices are just so high here that usually means you need 20 percent down however for conforming loans regular like Fannie Mae, Freddie Mac loans. They have all these wonderful, like, you know, quote unquote, first time buyer programs. And we qualified because I have owned my property. I haven't had a new first time buyer loan in over two years. We can get an owner occupied loan for just 5% down. Yeah, that's amazing. That's crazy. At 3% interest, like, <laughs> that's. That's amazing. 5% of 280K is like nothing. It's awesome. Yeah, so that's why we can just buy another property. Probably we have it's just 10 minutes from downtown, 10 minutes from maybe where our friends live too. There's good Asian food around good Asian too, food around. which is very important gym. for me. I'm excited. I'm super excited. So we're planning to move in January. It's gonna be in two months or so. Yeah, I mean, it's cool because like, Personally, I've never like lived anywhere else besides California, like mm -hmm. Bay Area, Los Angeles. And same with you. Oh, actually, you did travel for two years. Yeah, but I never lived in one place for an extended period of time. I mean, I just did month to month when I was traveling. And also going with you would be like a fun adventure, right? Yeah, yeah. Doing that together. So I'm excited for it, right? The opportunity of doing many more real estate deals. Honestly, I feel like practice a lot on these like cheaper homes, do a lot of deals, get really good at flipping houses, bring that expertise back from the Bay Area from you know when we move, maybe two or three years afterwards, mm -hmm. do that same strategy here in the Bay Area. I think we're like in that learning phase. So every experience is exciting to us. Even Airbnb being our place, we learn I think so much from that and we're going to put that into the Dallas market yep. and we're going to have a lot of opportunities to continue practicing, build our portfolio, replicate it wherever we want to do that. For me, like my goal right now is just continue to learn, continue to grow. That's why it's just like really fun and exciting. And we can document it as well mm -hmm. for our channels. I mean, again, that's a cool thing about the place that we're going to because Airbnb is so prevalent there. Every project we do can either be a flip where we sell the property or we can hold it as an Airbnb. Full exit strategies, just like you mentioned.
That's what I always aim for, to have that safety net, because I'm definitely way more like risk averse than maybe most. So I always take those calculated risks like, okay, if this happens, can I still do this? You know, if I can't flip it, can I hold it? Or like, can I Airbnb it? If I can't Airbnb it, can I do the long term? It's nice to have all these different ways to be safe, essentially. Yep, absolutely. We're all super excited with what's going to happen in your future. Sharon, thank you again so much for coming on the show. Do you have any last words of wisdom that you'd like to live to our listeners before you wrap up? today? Well, I would say continue to take action and just do what your heart tells you to do. This move has been something I've thought about for a long time. First, we were thinking maybe Vegas or somewhere else, but like... Even Nashville, we're thinking of Nashville. Yeah, we're thinking about so many different places, but it's been something I've thought about for a while because it's like, why can't we house hack and work somewhere else where we grow our operations? And I think we can grow so much faster. That's because we are taking this risk, doing what our heart tells us is right. Make sure you do what your heart tells you is right. Very cool. So thanks again for coming on our show. How can people find out more about you? So you guys can find me on Instagram, TikTok, YouTube under Sharon Sung. So just look up my full name. You can also check out my blog, digitalnomadquest.com. If you guys are interested in investing out of State, you guys can check out our course, Remote Rental Riches. We've invested in multiple markets in different states. If you guys want that step-by-step guide, go ahead and check that out. Now, I hope you guys enjoyed this episode on all our updates. I know we went through a lot of different things because there's so much going on in our lives right now. It's really exciting. So if you guys like this episode, let me know in the comments below which part interested you guys the most. Make sure to subscribe and hit the bell button to be notified of my latest videos. Also, make sure to subscribe to Sean's channel where he talks all about real estate investing. And we'll see you guys in the next one. Thank you.